Shalom Israel, it's your brother Lamak. Um, and first and foremost, I want to give all honor, praises, and glory unto the Father who is the highest, who is the most high God. Um, and only him shall you praise, thus saith the Messiah, who the world refers to as Jesus the Christ. And speaking on Jesus the Christ, Yahweh Shai, Yeshua, Yahusha, all the various Hebrews that identify the anointed Savior, the anointed Messiah. This particular video is going to go on how Christ was all about the law, keeping God's laws, and telling others that they shall do the same, whether he was in his flesh or in resurrected form. And that the notion that the Old Testament is fulfilled is all doctrinal Roman Protestant doctrine, uh, doctrine Roman Catho uh, Catholic doctrine, where the Lord never established a covenant with Roman Ca Catholics and Roman Protestants in any of the offshoots of those particular branches of the religion of Christianity. In fact, the Lord said his covenant with the Levites to be his ministers would never end. Never. So the just the mere fact that everybody has to go through Roman Catholicism or Roman Protestantism as it pertains to covenants that have nothing to do with Roman people, uh, people should really put that in consideration. Stop believing everything that you're hearing because the pastors that you listen to receive their instructions of these covenants from their enemies and they bring it to you and as a result you don't know what's going on neither do you care to even study the bible to figure it out and that's where the brews come in at the ones who you liken as your enemies you think now is your moment and that we're the false teachers but all we ask is that you just continue to listen because the more you listen to us the more you're going to see that those people in those pulpits are lying, but it is what it is. So Christ was all about the law. He was born under the law. Okay. He performed the law and he never commanded that the law would be removed out of the way. In fact, the opposite. So anybody coming after Christ saying that you don't have to keep commandments, Either they're false teachers or you're not really understanding the gist of their doctrine. And that's clear in the scriptures. The only way you can arrive at that is by cherry picking in the scriptures. There's no way you can arrive at that through any command of Christ or the Most High God. So I'm going to begin at Luke chapter 2. And this is... Uh, the birth of Christ on the earth. Luke chapter 2, I'm going to start at verse 6, and it says, And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, talking about Mary. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him at the inn. So I'm going to drop down to verse 21. Feel free to go and read that whole chapter if you like. Verse 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So right off the bat, you see that Christ was born under the law. And that after eight days, he was circumcised and then he was named. So let's go to the law and see where um, this was accomplished. It's actually the token of the covenant of Abraham. But it was also written in the law that your child had to be circumcised at eight days. So this is Genesis 17 and 12. And it says, and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money 
of any stranger which is not of thy seed. That is the token of the covenant of Abraham. There is also, it's also in the law itself, which I will get to in a minute, which is an extension of the covenant, uh, the token of the covenant with Abraham. So going back to Luke, going to verse 22, and it says, And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they had brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, which lets you know that the law of Moses is the law of the Lord. Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy unto the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So right off the bat, he was circumcised after eight days. Mary, according to the law of Moses, she was going through the days of her purification because she had an issue of blood outside of her cycle. She had a child. So after the days of her purification, she herself had to present an offering unto the Lord because that is just the tenets of when a woman in Jerusalem or in Israel had a child. It's just the way that it is. You have to complete the days of your separation after you have a child. So um, let's go to the law of the Lord. Why would Christ want to do away with the law of the Lord? Make that make sense. So this is Exodus chapter 13, verse 1. And it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male, the firstborn from every womb from among the Israelites belong to me, both man and beast. So them consecrating Christ unto the Lord, bringing him unto the temple, um, is following the laws of the Lord. Okay? So every facet of his life, Everything he did, even to the point where he was resurrected, was all about what was written of him in the law of the Lord. And why would you want to remove that out of the way when you're written all over it? Many things that were said about you are in the law of the Lord, which is the law of Moses. Just I'm just putting little gems out there for you to write down in your notes okay so this is leviticus chapter 12 starting in verse 1 it says and the lord spake unto moses saying speak unto the children of israel saying if a woman conceived seed and born a man child then she shall be unclean for seven days according to the days of separation for her infirmity she shall be unclean that's talks about the days of her separation for having a child, a man child. And in the eighth day of the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. So like I said previously, the extension of the covenant of Abraham, the token of the covenant of having your foreskin of a male circumcised after eight days is also written in the law of Moses, which is synonymously called the law of the Lord. Okay, dropping down to verse 6, and it says, And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the Lord of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest. There were literally all types of offerings. Every offering unto the Lord did not require a sacrifice. A meat offering, a meat offering has nothing to do with sacrificing animals. You're actually making unleavened cakes or unleavened wafers mingled with oil. That's your meat offering. You can either make it by baking it in the oven, baking it in a pan, or frying it in a pan. Those are the three ways that you make or create a meat offering unto the Lord. And it had nothing to do with actual carcass. 
But according to your pastors, they don't know anything. They think every sacrifice has to do with sin and every sacrifice had to do with killing an animal. But moving on. Verse seven, and the priest who shall offer it before the Lord and shall make an atonement for her and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that hath born a male or a female. So again, this is for every step and fetching black pastor who more importantly, the ones that come after us, like we're some type of satanic cult which is crazy that they would even fathom that out that idea but just this chapter two of luke alone lets you know how biblically inept they are and how much they don't know about the bible and that sacrifices were not just for sin this is the law of a woman who has a child in israel that she had to bring a sacrifice after the days of her purification. What the hell does that got to do with sin? Is it a sin to have a child? No, you're actually keeping the law by having children because the first commandment given to mankind is to be fruitful and multiply. So that ought to let you know biblic biblically where these pastors are when it, uh, as it pertains to the scholarship in the Christian church or lack thereof but y'all esteem these dudes and call them men of the lord and they don't even know the basics they don't even know the basics of the lord's word for you to even bestow that title upon them moving on so let's go to the acts of the one they call jesus christ let's see how he was moving when he was um doing his ministry and bringing forth the gospel to the Israelites. This is John chapter eight. And it says, when Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives early in the morning, he came again unto the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law, remember the law of the Lord, commanded us that such should be stoned. What sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So Christ ignored them because they actually thought they were going to, you know, confound him in the law that he knew better than all of them. Right. Let's continue. So when they continue asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted himself up and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Have no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So the Roman Protestant and Roman Catholic understanding is that Jesus uh, either broke the law or he changed the law right there. Um, that is a horrible breakdown of scripture. And the reason why it's horrible is because they never go to the law to see why Christ did any of the things that he did. But with the same hypocritical lips, they say he fulfilled the law perfectly. Which is it? Did he break the laws or did he change the laws or did he fulfill it perfectly? What's, um, what people should understand about this is that when these accusers brought this adulterous woman Unto, unto Christ, 
they missed the key point about it. Okay, what are the key points? That they were trying to confound him in the law. Okay, verse 6 says, And they, in this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger. He wasn't bothered by him. All he did was end up confounding them in the spirit. And as a result, they dropped their stones and left. Okay, well, let's see what the law says about adultery. And then we can begin to understand why Christ did what he did, which was confound the men until they left and left the woman and him alone. Okay, so this is Leviticus 20, starting at verse 10. And it said, And the man which committed adultery with another man's wife, even he that committed adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So stoning the woman is the sin, is the, the recompense for adultery. Make no mistake about it. If they would have stoned her later on, they would have been well within their right under the law. But since the stoning would have not have been executed correctly in the manner of the law of Moses, right there when they brought her to, to, to Christ, he offered her repentance. But what did he tell her? He told her, don't do it again, meaning you keep God's laws. Now, they brought this adulterous woman unto him. Did they bring the adulterer? No, they didn't bring the man that she slept with. They just brought her. But the under the law, it says both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. Well, um, they were trying to confound him in the law because they told him that she was caught in the very act. So if she was caught in the very act, where is the adulterer? So Christ, being way smarter than any of these goofballs that were trying to confound him, ended up confounding them in the spirit until they left. Because they knew they were convicted, they knew they were sinners, and they knew that he knew. How they knew he knew, they probably didn't know, but they knew he knew, and they dropped the stones and left. And number two, the adulterer was not brought to the forefront. Okay, and on top of that, Whoever the spouse was that the act was committed against, that spouse, if I'm not mistaken, gets to perform the stoning. So where was that person at? So you have to understand a little bit of the law, at least a small amount of the law, before you can try to figure out why Christ did what he did. Did he change the law? No. Adulter adultery is still punishable by death. But both gets put to death, but only one was brought forth. Okay? So he offered her repentance. Mercy is what he offered her. Okay? Moving on. So let's go to when the disciples first uh, found Christ for the first time. Uh, let's go to John chapter 1. We'll start at 44. And it says, Now Philip was, was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him, whom Moses in the law, the law of God, and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazar Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So let's see what the prophets wrote about Christ of Nazareth that was that end up being being his name well let's see what some of the prophets wrote about him many of them wrote about him I don't have for the sake of the video I'm not going to bring out every last prophecy of Christ and you know you're not going to get that from your Christian pastors either because in their efforts to debunk us they're learning from us because when we bring out certain scriptures, they add it to their repertoire. And then they started to use it from that point on. It happened to me. It happened to all the people who are Hebrews who are trying to teach these people today. And we're running into their pastors. And their pastors think that, that this is their moment. 
that they're coming after us and we're the cult. But they don't even know these basic prophecies of the one they call God. But anyway, we have found the one that Moses in the law and in the prophets did right. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. This is Isaiah 42, starting at verse 1. It says, Behold my servant, whom I upheld, mine elect, in whom my soul delighted. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he shall not break, and the smoke and flax he not quench. He shall bring forth his judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he has set judgment in the earth. And check this part out. And the isles shall wait for his law. So how did he come to do away with the law of God when the prophecy, when the prophecy of Christ says the owls shall wait for his law? No, 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 no. Surely Isaiah said he's going to remove the law, right? Oh, OK, OK, OK. Let's drop down to verse 19, same chapter, chapter 42. It says, who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who was blind as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant, seeing many things, but thou observest not, opening the ears, but his ear is not. So he's not worried about all the things that can take him away from his mission. He's blind. Y'all ever heard the story? Um, Ray Charles to the bull to the bullshit. Excuse my language. That's basically what he's saying. He's blind to all the nonsense and deaf to all the nonsense. Because he is perfect, he's going to observe, I mean, he's going to complete the mission. He shall not be shaken from it. Seeing many things, but observeth not, opening the ears, but he heareth not. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. Check this out. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. No, 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 Lamarck. Surely that says he's going to remove the law and take it out of the way. No, it doesn't say that. There is no prophecy that Christ is going to undo what his father enacted. That is bonkers to teach people that, that that is the mission, that he was coming to take that out of the way. It's not prophesied, nor did you see that in his walk. How you derive of that is you try to go to Paul's letters, and because you're not well versed in the Old Testament, you don't even understand what Paul was writing. And as a result, everybody in the religion of Christianity think the law is on the cross. And that is bonkers. That is crazy that anybody would teach that Christ came to undo what the father enacted. When Christ said he's coming to fulfill the will of his father. That is hypocrisy. That is oxymoronic. That is ironic. You know, it, it doesn't even make sense. It doesn't, that literally doesn't make sense. It doesn't say anywhere he would remove the law out of the way. So let's see how um, Christ made the law honorable. Okay, let's go to Matthew 5, chapter 5. This is a, this is a chapter, they don't read the whole chapter. They read uh, up to verse 17, and that's the end of that thing. OK, but if you continue reading, you begin to see how he made the law honorable. It says, think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets are come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Really, he's coming to fill, fulfill the law and the prophets. What did the what we just read? What the prophets wrote that he's coming to make the law honorable. So how do you fulfill that? How do you fulfill making the law honorable if you're removing it out of the way? Christians, you have some explaining to do. Pastors, you have some explaining to do. And more importantly, you have some repenting to do. Verse 18, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And as we continue in this video, we will see if all was fulfilled or not. 
Now, listen how he continues to make the law honorable and to magnify it. Verse 19, whosoever shall therefore break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So this is Christ, Christ seeing the end of the world. Seeing, foreseeing and foretelling what the end of the world shall be, that whoever breaks these least commandments and teach men that they can do it, you're going to be the least in the kingdom. What do these Christian pastors do? Don't they teach you can break the commandments? All you got to do is have faith. Isn't that literally the doctrine of Christianity that is spread all over the earth? But this is the Messiah, the one who's going to sit on the throne of his forefather, David saying that whoever says you can you you don't have to do it and you break the least one the least of god's commandments from the law of the lord you're going to be called least in the kingdom make that make sense because there's a lot of christian believers um and i'm only worried about the the lost tribes of israel i'm not worried about nobody else of course you can listen to any of our videos you can learn from us i it doesn't bother me one way or the other. My mission is, can the children eat? That's my mission. And it's a lot of lost sheep in these churches being led astray, being led to the lake. And us, the bruised, we're trying to save you as well as trying to save ourselves. And it is what it is. Either you're going to hear it or you're going to forbear it. But I'm giving you Christ. I'm giving you Christ. I'm not giving you Brother Lamarck. Okay? Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, listen to how he's continuing to magnify the law. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, Ye shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. You got pastors like Creflo Dollar. He says the law was sent to condemn you. Where is that in the scriptures, my guy? Yeah, the Lord going to kill you, brother. I hate to say it, but hell, somebody got to be the one that's going to fall by the edge of that two-edged sword. It just so happens it's going to be you unless you repent. Because a lot of people esteem Creflo Dollar as if he's a man of God. He's actually satanic because he's teaching directly against the law of the Lord, which means he's teaching directly against what Christ taught. It is what it is. Verse 21, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. It's really thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not murder. But I say to you, let's see if he's going to remove that law or if he's going to magnify it. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. You see that? And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, that's like bonehead, um, any insult really, but that's Hebrew shall be in danger of the council and whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire is that removing the law out of out of the way or magnifying it making it honorable telling you you better love your brother now you can precept that with the scripture in first john that says whoever uh hated his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer have eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. So that's how much loving your brother as yourself takes precedent now more than ever. Because those that, that's one of the things that Christ is going to judge you on. Did you love your Israelite brothers? Did you love your northern kingdom brothers that were scattered on the four corners of the earth that never even they never even got a chance to even see Christ? In Judea they were already gone scattered on the the part of the earth where never mankind dwelt so it's important that you love your brother and if your brother trespass against you charge it to the game 
you know, pray that the Lord will deliver them from their, their lost ways. And, you know, the Lord will end up restoring you from everything that they took from you anyway. Let it go. Let it go, man. Your brothers are destroyed. They're part of a destroyed people. They don't know who they are, okay? They haven't had their breakthrough yet, all right? See, the, the Most High God is choosing who he wants. It tells you, I believe it's in John chapter 6, verse 44, that you can't even come to Christ unless the Lord, the highest, draws you himself, okay? So the Lord is sifting through the kingdoms, and he wants who he wants. And we can only pray uh, that the elect and the innumerable multitude get brought out of this satanic world that we live in and, 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 and finally get all the promises that were bestowed upon them according to the promises of the forefathers. Um, it is what it is. Uh, but whoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the, um, I'm sorry, moving on, moving on. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, your offering, and there remember thou, and there rememberest that thy brother has ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way and first be reconciled unto thy brother, then come, then come and give the altar. So he's saying, don't even... Be consumed with bringing your offering and your oblations to the altar. If you ain't having done the mer the bare minimum of keeping God's laws, and that's loving your brother, go and make it right with whoever you have an issue with among your people, man. Get that right, and then, br then bring your offering. This is what Christ is saying. This is how he's making the law honorable, okay? Because loving your brother as yourself, that's in Ch uh, Leviticus chapter 19. Christ is only reiterating the law of the Lord or the law of Moses, as it is called even in the New Testament. So moving on, let me drop down to verse 27. You have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her had committed adultery with her in his heart. Is that removing the law concerning adultery out of the way, or is he making it honorable? Now, the context here is adultery. What is adultery? A man sleeping with a married woman or a married woman sleeping with anybody else outside of her husband. So the context is saying, but I say unto you, that whoever looks upon a woman, he's talking about a married woman, to lust after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart. This is not saying looking at a random woman. Um, well, I guess it depends. It really depends because lust is an action. If you look at a woman and you bring forth an action to that lustful desire, then yes, you're committing adultery in your heart. Okay? But it's not wrong to desire a woman because it even says in the law that if you find a woman and, yet, and thou shalt desire her, how do you desire a woman if you're not looking at her? You know what I'm saying? But the key word here is lusting after her. And the context is a married woman or it's not adultery. Okay. So is he making it honorable or is he removing it out of the way? I think you're starting to get the picture now unless you're just devoid spiritually. It is what it is. Let whoever hear it, hear it. Let whoever ignores it, let them be ignorant still. It is what it is. Moving down to verse 31, it's a lot of ways that Christ magnified the law. I would be all day if I go through all of them. It had been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. That's in the law. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, that is a illegal sexual offense, like adultery, or sleeping with a beast, or sleeping with your fa like your your family members, incest. That's all that is fornication, illegal sexual acts. But I say, whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committed adultery. This is Christ overruling divorce. 
He says, if you marry that woman, unless she commits fornication, you can't just write a, a writ of divorce, uh, papers of divorcing, simply because you don't desire her no more. And that's actually actually in the law. You're not supposed to put law post supposed to put your wife away. And he reiterates, I believe, in Mark seven that that was only added because of um, because of the way these guys were going about carrying themselves in that time. Okay. Um, loosely translated, it's in Mark 7. Again, ye have heard that it had been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but thou shalt perform thine oaths. This is talking again about the law. The law says, You shall not swear unto the Lord or make an oath or a vow unto him, because he definitely is going to require it. You don't swear on his name unless you do it. But this, listen to what Christ says, But I say unto you, Swear not at all. Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. Neither by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither thou shalt swear by thy head, because thou cannot make one white hair or black. So this is the ways that Christ magnified the law and made it honorable. So where do you get removing the law from any of this? So... The biggest thing uh, about chapter five is where he says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise see the kingdom. How were the Pharisees and scribes righteous? How were they righteous? They were righteous because they knew the laws of God. They just weren't doing them. OK, they were forcing uh, everybody else to do the law and uh, traditions of men and doctrines of men. But they themselves weren't doing the law. Let's get the context. Let's go to Matthew 23. And we will start at verse number one. And it says, then Jesus spake to the multitude. And to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatever so they bid you observe, that you observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not do. And that was a problem that he had with the Pharisees, because they knew everything that you were supposed to do as it pertains to the law. They just weren't doing them. But what did he tell the Israelites at that time? The scribes and Pharisees, those are the religious leadership of this time. They sit in Moses' seat and everything they tell you, you better do it. How is that removing the law out of the way? Doesn't that sound like he's magnifying the law and making it honorable? And that is the problems that he had with the Pharisees. But the biggest, one of the biggest things he had about the Pharisees is even though they knew the law, there were certain parts of the law that they were ignoring while bringing forth traditions of men. So let's prove that. Let's drop down in the same chapter to verse 23. And this is Christ saying, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin, but have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Let's see what those weightier matters are. Judgment. Mercy. And faith, these ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. So they weren't enacting the mercy and the faith parts of the law. What is a, uh, an example of the mercy that they weren't enacting, but that Christ showed? When they brought that adulterous woman to him and they did not bring the adulterer, the adulterer with her, Christ showed her mercy. And gave her an opportunity to repent. And because if they stoned her, it would not have been done in accordance to the manner of the law, which was in the law of Moses. He gave her an opportunity to turn away from sin. But what, what did he tell her at the end of it? Don't do it again. Keep God's laws. Are we starting to understand? 
in his ministry, he made the law honorable. Manners of mercy, manners of judgment, manners of faith. Let's go back to the law and see if faith was a part of it. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. And we'll start at 16. And it says, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations, Pro provoked they him to anger. So they provoked the Lord with their abominations. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that newly came up, whom their fathers feared not. And of the rock that begot them, uh, and I'm sorry, and of the rock that begot thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten the God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them and I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation, sinful children in whom is no faith. Faith has always, always been part of the law. And that was the weightier matters that was missing in the time of Christ. So moving on, let's continue to, to see how Christ moved in his ministry, how he taught the law. And what was he telling the people as he was ministering, healing them, performing miracles on his way to being the ultimate sin offering in the end? Right. Nowhere in any of this ministry are you seeing or hearing, you know, don't worry about it. I'm going to fulfill it. I'm going to be on the cross in a minute. You ain't got to worry about this burden that's on you. It's it's crazy that that is the doctrine that everybody believes. But I'm going to tell you like this. You're supposed to seek the narrow gate. That's not the narrow gate. It's like four billion people that believe that nonsense. And that's not the narrow gate. It says few find it. And you have to make the call for yourself because what? I'm giving you Christ, okay? I'm giving you Christ. You don't, you're not going to have an excuse after this. So it is what it is, man. It is what it is. So let's go to Luke 5, okay? Um, Luke 5, we'll start at verse 12. And it says, And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou will, thou can make me clean. He put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he charged him to tell no man, but listen, listen to what he says, but go and show thyself to the priest and offer thy cleansing according as Moses commanded. For a testimony unto them. Did he say, I'm, you know, ain't no more sacrifice. Don't worry about it. You clean now. You ain't got to worry about it. I'm fulfilling all this law. You know what I'm saying? I'm removing all that out of the way. No. He was born under the law. He taught the law. He told others to keep the law. And even after healing people, he was sending them to go. And to bring an offering unto the temple to the priests, which is all in the law. This is Leviticus 14 and 1. Let's see. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, this shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest and the priest shall go out of the camp and the priest shall look. Then if the case of the leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed two live clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthen vessel over fresh water. He shall take the live bird with the cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip them in the live bird dip and Dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water, and he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird go into the open field. So, again, 
This is also to show these so-called apologists again that every sacrifice had didn't have anything to do with sin. This man was sick. He had a leprous disease and a sacrifice was required when he got, you know, according to the ways of his cleansing. Again, these people don't even know the rudiments of God's word to, for you to even bestow this, this pedestal that they're on saying that these are men of God. How do you not know this? How do you do not? If you don't know this, then you miss the whole gospel. This is all over the gospel. This is all in Christ's ministry. How do you not know this if you're the man of God that we're supposed to look to? If you're the man of God that was sent. It's crazy. So moving on. Let's go to when Christ died. Okay. Let's go to when Christ died. All right. Let's see if they stop keeping the law. All right. So this is Luke 24, and I'm going to start at verse 23. All right. They were looking for him. He had already died and he was in the tomb, in the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. Then certain of them which were with us went into the sepulchre and found it even so, as the woman had said, but they, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. That's Christ again referring to the prophets about all the things that they said about him. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So this is Christ even being resurrected, even being resurrected, still going to the prophets and to the law of Moses concerning the things that pertain to him. Why is he still referring to the law if at the death of Christ, he removed the law out of the way? So I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, lost sheep of Israel, Jeshurun, if you, in all your time in the church of being taught about Christ, if they never begin in the law of Moses and the prophets, then you have never been taught about Christ. Ever. Ever. So, moving on. I mean, I got so much more to go through. Um, let's go to how he was rebuking the Pharisees again. Let's go to Mark 7. We'll start at verse 8. And this is what Christ is saying. He said, for you, and, I'm, and this is in the NLT because it reads much better and you can really get the emphasis of how he's rebuking these people. It says, for you ignore God's laws and substitute your own tradition. Then he said, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your tradition. For instance, Moses gave you this law from God, honor your father and mother. And anyone who speaks disrespectfully of their father and mother must be put to death. But you say it is all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you. For I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you let them disregard their needy parents. And so you canceled the word of God in order to hand down your own tradition. And this is only one example among many others. Why is Christ rebuking them for putting forth traditions of men, for putting forth traditions of men, Instead of keeping God's laws, if he's just going to end up removing the law anyway. Moving on. Christ continued to teach the law and operate in the law because he was all about the law. The laws of Christ literally uh, are the laws of Moses, but magnified. That's the gospel or you miss the whole gospel, which most of you did trying to put Paul's letters above Christ's gospel 
and you can't even understand Paul's letters because you don't know the law, you don't know the prophets, and you clearly don't know Christ. But let who have ears hear and those who forbear, it is what it is. So this is Matthew 14, starting at 33. It says, And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret, and when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around all that region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment as many and as many touched it were all made well. So this is Christ. And they're, they're saying that he wore fringes. Were, aren't fringes a part of the law? This is the book of Numbers, chapter 15, verse 38. Speak to all the Israelites and tell them throughout their generations to come, throughout all their generations to come. They are to make for themselves fringes on the corners of their garment with a border of blue. That's clear. So I can go on and on, man. I got so much information that I can put in this video, but, you know, my brothers and sisters only have a small window that they're willing to pay attention. So I'll try to make it concise. So this is Christ. You can see he was born under the law, kept the law, made it honorable, magnified it, blasted people who substituted traditions for God's laws. He told people that he, clen he cleansed to go give a sacrifice. And even getting off the cross, he started to teach out of the law all things that were pertaining to him so i don't know where he's going to remove this out of the way that's just that's just not even in the scriptures you know what i'm saying uh let's see what else i can get mm -mm -mm. let's go back to when uh, christ had died already okay so this is when uh, the counselor went to Pilate to go and ask for Christ's body. I'm going to skip down to verse 52 of Luke 23. And it says, this man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And when he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in the sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid, and that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. And the women also, which came with them from Galilee, followed after, and beheld the sepulcher, and how his body was laid. And they returned, and prepared spices and ointments, and rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Why are they still keeping the commandments after Christ died? If by his death, he's removing it out of the way, because that was never the assignment. That was never the assignment. Christ is magnifying the law and making it honorable and commanding all to do it. OK, now the curse and the punishments of the law will inevitably be taken away. Nobody's coming to your house to stone you for sin. You actually have an opportunity to get yourself right. That's the grace. If you didn't keep the Sabbath in old times, you got put to death for not keeping the Sabbath. People break the Sabbath every single day, but you have grace to get yourself right before the just one returns and begins to subdue the earth and judge it. But I can, like I said, I can only give you Christ. You can ignore it. You can continue to listen to these buffoons like T.D. Jakes, who's getting swallowed up, and Creflo Dollars, who's saying that the law was sent to condemn you, Jamal Bryan, who says that Christ was out of order for 90% of his life. These are the guys you call men of God. These, who the, these are the people whose quote-unquote churches you're filling up to receive instruction, okay? But it's not according to the scriptures. They're just teaching out of their own minds, so in closing, I'm going to go to Luke 24, 44. This is Christ teaching. This is after he's clearly have been resurrected. And he said, and, the, and he said unto them, these are the words I spake 
uh, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And many of the, the laws in, um, in the many of the prophecies in the law concerning Christ in the prophets concerning Christ and in the Psalms concerning Christ has not been fulfilled. It has not been fulfilled. OK, here's one. Here's one. And it's right in line with what I'm teaching today. OK, I'm going to give you the New Testament and then I'm going to show you in the prophets what it's talking about is Luke 7, 26. And it says, but what went out ye for to see a prophet? Yeah, I say unto you much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it was written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall pre prepare the way before thee. So this is the prophecy talking about how uh, who the man who would end up being called John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way for Christ. Let's go to the prophecy about that. Let's go to Malachi 3. Okay? We'll see if this is fulfilled. Remember, Christ said, all things must be fulfilled. So this is uh, Malachi 3 starting at 1. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, the Adonai, whom ye, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come into his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So yes, this part was fulfilled. John the Baptist prepared the way. Uh, if you read in Luke 1, verse 16, you can see how he was preparing the way. Okay, that's a very powerful chapter. Okay, but let's see if all this is fulfilled concerning Christ. But who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Listen to this part. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now, wait, did Christ purify the sons of Levi that the offerings and, and, and all the sacrifices would be pleasing unto the Lord again? I thought he was removing the law out of the way. What happened to that? Verse 4, then shall the offering of Judah in Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. Was that fulfilled? Did that Was that accomplished? Did, did sacrifices be pleasant unto the Lord again when Christ was at the cross? Did he purify the sons of Levi and refine them? And now everybody's bringing offerings un unto the Lord as in the former years. No, that has not been fulfilled. So all has not been fulfilled. That is Christian dogma given to you by people who have nothing to do with God's covenants. And that's who you listen to. That's who your pastors listen to. And in closing, I will. Uh, I will go to Christ basically telling you. That the kingdom, the kingdom depends on how you observe God's laws. Let me go to, there's many places I can go to. I'll go to the parable of the kingdom in Matthew 13, because this is one that, that's never brought out in Israel. And if any of my brothers hear this, I would like for you to, to catapult it forward because it only adds to what we've been what we've been teaching this whole time. Third, Matthew 13, 47 says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered out every kind. So a net is put into the sea and gathered all kinds of life. Right. Which when it was full, the net, they drove, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels and cast the bad away. So they went into the net and all the good uh, life that was gathered from the sea, they put into vessels and all the bad they cast away. 
check it out. Verse 49. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. This is Christ seeing the end of the world and giving you a warning that the angels are coming to sever the wicked from among the just. When you look in the Greek, the word for just is diakalos. Diakalos. I think I'm, I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. Diakalos. Just look in your lexicon. And when you look in the lexicon, the definition of just is those who are, are observing the divine laws of God and keeping the commandments. There is nothing that your Christian pastor can say. Nothing. He can talk about being just all he wants, but the just one says, my angels are coming to gather those who are uh, keeping God's laws in the end time. So even when you go to Paul and it says that the just shall live by his faith, the word for just is still those who are observing God's laws. There's no way to separate the law from grace. You're supposed to be keeping God's commandments and the faith of Christ, like it says in Revelations 14, 12. Not just believing grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. Ah, and all that nonsense they teach you. And I got time for one more, and this is how I'm going to conclude it. This is Matthew 7. And I'm going to read it in the NLT because it reads so much better. And it says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my father in heaven will enter. It get, there's more. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and do them, I will liken unto, unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And I'm telling you, this is literally a precursor of what will befall people who call themselves believers, talking about faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone. He said many of that day will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in thy name. That's the Christian church. We cast out demons in your name. That's the Christian church. We perform many miracles in your name. That's the Christian church. They did all this. That's, that's their belief. We believed on you. These people who are prophesying and casting out demons and miracles, they believed on Christ. But what were they missing? But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. You never hearken unto the Father who is the highest and tried your best to do his laws, his commandments that you were commanded in the law of Moses, which right here in the gospel was synonymous with the law of the Lord in the prophets, in the Psalms, and also in Christ's teachings. You were commanded to keep these. The only way you were told not to do it is in that Christian church who gets their instruction from a people who these covenants were never given to. Now, like I said before, I'm just trying to get this blood off my hands. I know better, so I'm trying to put it out there for you to get it. Okay, the more you listen to the Hebrews, you're going to learn this Bible and you're going to learn about your God and hopefully make it about this thing. We hope that we make it out this thing. We hope we can put this out so it can be accounted unto us as good works because Christ said, I'm coming to judge you according to your works. He didn't say I'm coming to judge you according to your faith or according to your spirit. So I'm telling you, learn God's commandments. Do them to the best of your ability. Obviously, you can't do them all. I went through some today. You're not a leper. So why would we require you to go and bring a sacrifice for being a leper? You, everybody is, everybody's not a woman. 
Christ was not a woman. Did he had to did he have to go through a days of purification? That's in the law. It doesn't pertain to Christ. There are laws for farmers. If you're not a farmer, you don't have to worry about those laws. There are laws for a lawyer. If you're not a lawyer, you don't have to worry about those laws. There are laws for judges. If you're not a judge, you don't have to worry about those laws. But you're not going to tell me that Christ said it's okay now. You can now sleep with animals. Okay? That you can now sleep with your father's wife. You can now sleep with your sister. These are God's laws, and they are they are teaching directly against that. God said, you can't do any of these things. You mean to tell me Christ said, you can do it now? You people are are, are very insane, man. And, and you know what? It's, it's not entirely your fault. It's the people who you esteem as men of God. They're the ones that's teaching you this, okay? But do yourself a favor. Before you go out and you condemn God's laws, before you condemn the law of Moses, I would ask you to at least acquaint yourself with these laws because at the end of the day, Moses didn't make this stuff up. The Lord, the highest smoke made it up. It is literally his will and Christ said you must do it. And with that, I wash my hands of it. I like to give all honor, praises and glory unto the father who is the most high God. And only him shall you praise, thus saith the Messiah, who the world refers to as Jesus the Christ. I want to thank all my brothers who are on the highways and byways, um, rebuking these spirits to their face and trying to raise up the hopeful elect. Uh, my heart warm, uh, warmest desire is that all Israel be saved, the Israelites who are scattered on the four corners of the earth. And... Um, to the end, I would like to say a, a nice shalom and shalom to all my brothers and sisters in the faith. Stay steadfast and endure until the end. Shalom.